Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around I've got some hidden gems from the early 1960s. They just happened to arrive at the same time and I thought they made a nice package. So I've got three movies, you might have heard of some of them at least, but three movies that really are something special but don't always get enough love when people are talking about movies from the early 1960s. There are smaller films that are really kind of cool and some of them being released on blu-ray which makes it even nicer now blu-ray's getting to be an interesting thing because the big companies and i, I poached a lot of this information from heath's serial at midnight channel so you should go and look at that as well basically the big companies aren't interested in physical media anymore so that's left the field open for a lot of boutique companies to come in and start giving us kind of second tier obscure things that yet still are really really interesting and are starting to get more of a critical gaze on them and people are discovering them and liking them and that's kind of cool for me because b pictures were pretty much all i saw i didn't i saw mary poppins when i was a kid but apart from that b pictures were what i saw on the saturday matinees and so physical media suddenly getting b pictures and producing really great transfers of the films plus a whole bunch of really on point and beautifully done ancillary information on the extras is just what i need and i will always support physical media for that reason all the companies criterion uh, kino lorba indicator and uh, impulse and umbrella entertainment they're all doing really interesting films you kind of might have heard of but you might not have seen two of these movies are in black and white and one's in colour. And I'll do the one in colour first because it's the one I've watched most recently and I enjoyed. Imprint have just put it out on Blu-ray. And it's a little film starring William Holden and Lily Palmer called The Counterfeit Traitor. From 1961, directed by George Seaton. It's got a nice supporting cast as well. How does a person get to be so cold-blooded? Watching German planes bomb London helps enormously. The movie is cast really interestingly. So it's set in Europe during World War II and all of the German characters are played by German actors. The Swedish characters are played by Swedish actors. The Danish characters are played by Danish actors. And apart from William Holden, there's not anybody in this film that's playing somebody who is not of their own nationality. Though the character he plays, Eric Erickson, was an American Swede. He was born in America, but moved to Sweden and became a Swedish citizen in the 1920s. He was a real-life undercover spy for the Allies during World War II. Sweden during the war was neutral and was doing trade with Germany. And this guy, Erik Eriksson, was involved in the oil trade between Germany and Sweden during World War II. And in America, they put him on a blacklist of Nazi collaborators. Even though he had given up his American citizenship, he was put on a blacklist for the specific reason of recruiting him to become an intelligence agent spying on the Germans. He did a lot of trips back and forth between Sweden and Germany. And he was recruited by an interesting character whose codename is Dallas, played in the movie by Hugh Griffith. In the real world, there are a whole bunch of different handlers for Ericsson, but they've kind of condensed it down to this one very saturnine character which Hugh Griffith gets a lot of chances to steal the scenes he's in. And rightly so, his character is really fascinating. Hugh Griffith won a Best Supporting Actor Oscar for Ben-Hur, playing an Arab, oddly enough, uh, who was a, he's the Arab guy who runs horses and ends up giving the horses to Ben-Hur for the chariot race. Kind of a small role, very over the top, very theatrical, but it won the Oscar, oddly enough, against a much better field. But Hugh Griffith in this one is the first point at which the Ericsson character, who's very amoral and very capitalistic, gets to see that things are much more serious than he was letting himself realise. Uh, there's a few reality checks that Dallas gives to Ericsson before he's sent off to Germany to talk to his friends. All of his friends in Germany are kind of high-end industrialists. And his job is not only to get the information he can get, but to recruit them via bribery or blackmail 
to give him more information about where things are being manufactured in Germany to help the Allies bomb and destroy the infrastructure in Germany. Now, one of the connections he makes during the film is a woman who is an aristocratic woman, her husband's an officer in France, played by Lily Palmer. Now, the interesting thing here for me is it's kind of age-appropriate casting. They didn't get a 20-year-old girl, a woman in their 20s. For the actress, they got a mature woman, played by Lily Palmer, who was herself a German Jew, who went to England and America in the 1930s for reasons that would be obvious to anybody. Got successful, um, had a career, married Rex Harrison, and then divorced him so that he could marry his lover, Kay Kendall, who was dying of leukemia, but she didn't know it. So Lily Palmer gave up her husband so that another woman's final year of life could be much happier. It's a really interesting dynamic between those two. Leaving that aside, Lily Palmer's character is the source of information. He takes the information back and forth. And she has to give him some information because their courier has been captured. And the way they do it is to have um, the implication that the two characters are having an affair. Now, Lily Palmer's character won't necessarily do that because she's a devout Catholic, she's married, and so they have to pretend. She finds him a little pied a terre in uh, an obscure part of Berlin, and they have to go through the pretense of having an affair. And there's some really awkward moments when they're just discovering the things they need to know. If one of them is captured, they need to know intimate details of the other person so that people think it's just an affair and not um, an intelligence operation. And so there's an interesting and, and quite subtle exchange between the two because there's obvious um, attraction between the two characters, which develops as the movie progresses. But uh, there is that kind of awkwardness, which is a nice way of building the relationship before the relationship becomes anything. Your hair is most attractive. Is that the natural color? Yes. The two, while they're in this uh, pied de terre in, in Berlin, get caught in an Allied bombing rain and see what the war is doing to people. And they kind of help in a, in a church and, and uh, help the first aid people and things like that. They see the body of a young boy on one of the pews in the church. So things start getting real from there. And as things progress, it becomes harder and harder for both characters to realise that A, they're in love, and B, they are trying to survive the war and get the information which they need to help the Allies. And there's some very important information that Ericsson has to smuggle out physically from Germany to Sweden where his handlers are waiting. There's a harrowing escape after Ericsson is basically dobbed in by a little son of a friend who's a Hitler youth kid and has to flee Germany on a train and go through Denmark and then across the strait to Sweden while the Germans are patrolling that waterway. And it works really well. There's an incredible amount of intelligence trade craft that this movie passes on to us. The way somebody identifies somebody who is the person they're supposed to meet, the way people are handed off between various people on escape routes from Nazi Germany. Just there's a whole bunch of intelligence stuff there that's really well done and communicated really well, but gives you that kind of inside knowledge, which is always a nice thing to have in this kind of movie. The sea voyage uh, across to Sweden is, is quite harrowing. It's on a little fishing boat with some people who are helping him. And they're also taking across an escaping Jewish prisoner, played really strangely, but very well cast, by an actor I find totally repugnant, Klaus Kinski. But in this one, he doesn't get much to do apart from being unwell because the character is running a fever. He's got the shivers. They're trying to get him to freedom. And it's, it's a toss-up whether he's going to live or die if he gets there because he is quite ill. Of course, the implication there is he's escaped from a concentration camp. And that's kind of tense too. And the escape itself is really incredibly well done. It's all shot on location. None of this stuff is for the most part, except for the interiors, shot in a studio. It's all done on locations which were retrofitted to look like they did in the 1940s in three different countries. 
I think it, it deserves to be better known than it is. It was directed by George Seaton, and he does a really nice job of it as well. A really fine director. The extras on this one is an audio commentary by Lee Pfeiffer and Paul Scrabo. There's a documentary from 1989 called Golden Boy, which is about William Holden and his life and career. And I've seen that documentary before, and I highly recommend it. There's a trailer and a photo gallery. Uh, the inside disc cover, I like the I like the artwork on this one as well. I like that artwork. That's a very very 1960s artwork, but it's a really nice piece of production art. And there's that one as well on the inside. So both of these are great. This is one of those World War II movies, which doesn't really get enough oxygen, I think, because the character is is a kind of amoral person, but goes on that kind of turning of the moral compass ultimately to being a better person now the real life Eric Erickson probably didn't do much of that kind of moral compass turning but because the hero is played by William Holden it, it plays somewhat differently and the, the movie was based on a book written by a guy called Alexander Klein which was very popular at the time and uh, there were, of course that kind of book you know, true life adventures of World War II was very popular in the early 1960s for partly nostalgia reasons and for partly recognition of the people who were heroic in what they did during World War II. The first time I watched that, in fact, and that one really um, surprised me at the quality and the subtlety of it. And it's one of two movies that I'm going to talk about today which has an amoral lead character. That brings me to the second film. I'm trying to watch all of the Samuel Fuller movies that I haven't seen before. I think there are about two or three that I haven't seen. I want to get Blu-ray copies of whichever ones I can because I'm a big fan of Samuel Fuller's work. And this one turned up on sale uh, at one of my usual movie pushes. And uh, Indicator have put it out on Blu-ray. And it's a little film from 1961 called Underworld USA. Starring Cliff Robertson, Dolores Dawn and Beatrice Kay. Directed, written and produced by Samuel Fuller. It's a big picture for Columbia. It's kind of at the tail end of film noir. Thematically it has a few things and a few character beats which are very similar to other earlier Samuel Fuller movies. But I think it's well worth checking out. Very low budget. Shot mostly on the back lot at Columbia. It has one of the most amoral lead characters of any movie of its time. In the movie Cliff Robertson plays a guy called Tully Devlin who when he was 14 years old saw his father beaten to death by four guys he couldn't identify because he only saw their shadows on a wall which is a very kind of film noir way of dealing with it and he goes into reform school and then graduates into being a career criminal. The only person who is on Tully's side is an older woman called Sandy who ran a cocktail bar for a while and later on sold it and it became an espresso bar run by the mob. Now Sandy's played by Beatrice Kay and she's a character who kind of parallels Mo, the character played by Thelma Ritter in Pick Up on South Street, who was a kind of mother figure to Richard Widmark Skip McCoy. But in this one Beatrice Kay does a really nice job of giving us an interesting character. She collects dolls for reasons that young Tolly tells us in the early part of the film. My father told me why you collect these dolls. How would he know? He said you can't have kids of your own. Now Tolly knows that four men killed his father because he could see their shadows. And he tracks down one of them to prison when he's an adult. And that guy then tells him who the other three guys are. Problem for Tolly on his revenge kick is first off the first guy dies of a heart attack in hospital in the prison and so Tolly doesn't get his revenge on that guy. The th other three guys who killed Tolly's father became the lieutenants to the head of the mob, a guy called Connor played by Robert M. Hart. And so Tolly has to infiltrate the mob and basically find ways to destroy these guys. Meanwhile there's a troubleshooting um, government guy played by Larry Gates who's following up the other end of the things and forms an alliance with Tolly to take down the mob. 
Basically, this movie is Samuel Fuller's version of Yojimbo. Or earlier on, of course, Dashiell Hammett's Red Harvest, upon which Yojimbo was based. It's a single man who infiltrates a mob and plays them off against each other so they kill each other off. That's pretty much Underworld USA. While this is going on, Tolly meets a woman called Bubbles, who's involved with the mob and knows more than she's willing to tell anybody, played by Dolores Dawn, and they fall in love. But you've got to remember that nowhere in this movie does Tolly redeem himself. He is a solid, amoral character. And like all of Samuel Fuller's movies, this one is a blunt instrument. It's a piece of lead pipe wrapped in a towel as a movie. It's hard hitting. It really is a tough little film noir. And as Tolly, who is, is quite intelligent in a very primitive way, infiltrates the mob and plays them off against each other. And with the help of Larry Gates' character, fakes some information about various characters to help him along. He goes on this rampage of, of kind of subversion and of um, ruthless using of people to take the mob down. Cliff Robertson's an interesting actor. People keep telling me to do his movie Charlie as one of the movies for the channel. But I'm not in love with Cl Cliff Robertson's characterization of the character of Charlie in that movie. And I'm not entirely in love with his characterization of Tolly Devlin. Because Cliff Robertson was born into money. And here he is playing a, a kind of street urchin who grew up to be a safe cracker. And he, he's doing a kind of working class New York accent. And not necessarily doing it well. The intensity is there. I mean, all the character beats are there. But he's just a little bit too try hard for my taste on it. But in spite of that, Dolores Dawn's really good playing Bubbles. And Beatrice Kay is really great playing Sandy. And the guys playing the mobsters are really good as well. And Larry Gates is as well. He gets a really interesting scene with a corrupt police captain who tells him that the only reason he took the bribes and things is that the mob threatened to mince up his wife and return her to him in a basket. That's the kind of hard-hitting thing you get in a Samuel Fuller movie. And the scene with the police captain ends in a really interesting way. Uh, Samuel Fuller pulled no punches in his cinema. Again, it's a big picture that didn't get a lot of love. It, uh, it's not the best of Samuel Fuller's movies. There are other movies of Samuel Fuller's that are much better. But it's solid. It really is a, a tough little film. Now, the um, Blu-ray I've got, as I said, is an indicator Blu-ray. It's got some extras in it. It's got some interesting things in it. Uh, it's high-definition remaster of it. There's a little um, video of Martin Scorsese talking about Underworld USA and, and the influence it had on him. There's uh, Barry Forshaw on Underworld USA. There's the audio of a Sam Fuller masterclass with Vim Vendors, which for movie buffs is a, a great thing. And there are outtakes from an unedited interview footage from Tim Robbins' documentary, The Typewriter, The Rifle, and The Movie Camera, which is his documentary on Samuel Fuller. Uh, there's a trailer, there's image gallery, and English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. Give this one a go. Find a copy of this and watch it. I've seen people sing the praises of much worse film noirs than this one. And that kind of energetic and muscular storytelling that Samuel Fuller does makes it better than it would have been otherwise. It's same script, another director. It wouldn't have been as hard-hitting as this one is. And because it's a Columbia B picture, Samuel Fuller could get away with things that people in larger films couldn't get away with. There's a, There are so many implications of things and so much nastiness in this film that only a B picture could get away with. The big ones, the risk adverse. Disney will tell you that. But in spite of that caveat I've got about Cliff Robertson in this film, Underworld USA is rock solid for me. It's one of my favourite first watches of the year. And there have been some good ones this year as well. I'll post a link to my letterbox page so you can see what I've been watching this year. I'm trying to keep it up so I do one movie a day for the 364. And that in itself is an interesting challenge. So let's move on to movie number three. <laughs> Uh... 
So let's move on to movie number three. Again, it's an indicator title. I got three for $40, I think it was. And it's a movie that I've liked. I've mentioned it before when I did my video on mermaid movies. And it's a little film directed by Curtis Harrington from 1961, starring Dennis Hopper, Linda Lawson, and Luana Anders. Night Tide. I was waiting to get this Blu-ray because I wanted to talk about the movie in more detail. And here it is. This version of it says Nicholas Winding Refn, is it Nicholas Winding Refn or Nicholas Winding Refn? Someone tell me. Presents Dennis Hopper in Night Tide because Refn has the original negative of this film and had it digitally repaired because it was in fairly bad nick. And it's a perfect reproduction of the original film. The repair and restoration on this film is fantastic. It's a creepy little flick. In the movie, Dennis Hopper plays a sailor called Johnny, who is wandering Santa Monica Fun Pier. And he's in a little jazz club called the Blue Grotto and sees a beautiful woman called Maura, played by Linda Lawson. He um, asks her out on a date and they kind of, she's not interested at the start. She's just interested in listening to the jazz music. And then a creepy older woman, played by Marjorie Cameron, and hold that name because I'm going to tell you more about her later, walks up to Maura and says something to her in Greek, and then walks away. And Maura is visibly upset. She runs out of the nightclub. Johnny follows her and gets her to agree on a date, and they meet again and fall in love. Maura works on the fun pier as a mermaid in a sideshow run by Captain Murdoch, played by Gavin Muir. Caught you, Captain Murdoch. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Oh, I was, I was just thinking, my dear. Yes, I was, uh, I was merely contemplating some important matters in the quiet peace of the uh, summer afternoon. Mura also believes that she's one of the sea people and she's not human, and that one day she will have to return to the sea. The older woman speaking Greek is one of the sea people. Johnny also meets up with the granddaughter of the guy who runs the merry-go-round, a woman pl uh, played by Luana Anders, and they kind of get on okay, but Johnny's very focused on Mora. And we get the characters going on this journey on, is Mora actually one of the sea people? Is she a non-human who is destined to return to the sea after killing her lover? Now, we find out as the movie progresses that Mora's had a couple of other boyfriends who have died in mysterious circumstances. And the movie unfolds with Johnny meeting all these other characters on the fun pier. He meets a fortune teller played by Marjorie Eaton. There's two Marjories in this movie. What a dreadful invention these tea bags are. If everyone insisted on using tea bags, I'd never be able to read anyone's tea leaves. Isn't that so, young man? Yeah, I guess so. Of course, for myself, it doesn't really matter. I can't read my own anyway. Fortune tellers never can. Uh, who gives him a warning when she reads these tarot cards. Now, Marjorie Eaton has an interesting position in Star Wars movie history. In Empire Strikes Back, Marjorie Eaton played Emperor Palpatine until in 2004, George Lucas came back and replaced her with Ian McDermott. But physically, it was Marjorie Eaton who played the Emperor in the original release version of Empire Strikes Back. She was kind of cloaked and wearing a mask. But she was uh, a well-known artist in California. She was also an actress who had a long career in cinema. Really interesting over-the-top character actress. But uh, in this one, she's playing to the kind of material. Now, I mentioned Marjorie Cameron before. Marjorie Cameron was a really strange character. She was into sex magic. She was in a kind of group of magical practitioners, which included the director of this film, Curtis Harrington. And another movie director you might have heard of called Kenneth Anger. She was in one of Kenneth Anger's films as well. She had a really interesting history. Um, if you look up Marjorie Cameron on Wikipedia, you can go down that rabbit hole. She knew L. Ron Hubbard. She was a partner of one of the people who founded Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a rocket scientist who was also into sex magic. Uh, there's, uh, there's some weird characters in this film, and it works really well because of that. There are a couple of films you could pair this one with in a double feature. Probably one of them will be Carnival of Souls, Herc Harvey's movie with uh, Candace Hillgloss in it. Or the other one you could probably pair it up with in a double feature would be Francis Ford Coppola's Dementia 13. 
But uh, the lovely thing about this film is it builds an atmosphere. And ultimately, at the end of the film, you do find out what's actually happening. With one exception. There's one mystery which is left unsolved and deliberately so. Is it a fantasy? Is it a crime film? Is it a, a magical realism film? It's a bit hard to tell. But it is memorable and it's got a very understated leading character played by Dennis Hopper. A naive country boy sailor who's been in the Navy for a year and is not very worldly. And Dennis Hopper does underplay it as well. This is no Frank Booth in Blue Velvet kind of characterization. You get a little bit of that Dennis Hopper intensity at times, but he really does put across quite well the kind of character he's playing. Hopper had been in Hollywood for a decade before this movie was made. I think this may have been his first leading role. I'm not going to tell you any more about the plot because the plot is an interesting one. And the location shooting on the Santa Monica Pier in Venice, California, when it was very run down, gives you a real interesting atmosphere. I should say a really interesting atmosphere, which will stay with you for a while after you watch the film. It really is somewhat unlike any other film you've seen. Anyway, that's it for this time around. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. You can also donate to the channel at patreon.com slash paleocinema. I'll be back on the weekend with another bunch of movies. In the meantime, look after yourselves. Stay safe. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Try to find some hidden gem movies and talk about them. And I'll catch you next time. <laughs> Thank you.